Well, what we've learned from several decades of uh, neoadjuvant studies prior to radical prostatectomy is that um, when we use um, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, even for long periods of time, out to eight months, uh, when we combine androgen deprivation therapy with more potent AR pathway inhibitors, uh, out to six months, or even when we combine androgen deprivation therapy with chemotherapy, all regimens that have been shown to prolong life in advanced disease, but when we combine them in the neoadjuvant space, uh, our ability to get complete responses uh, continue to be less than 10%. So despite using active regimens, combinations of regimens that are life prolonging in the advanced space, these fail to achieve a high level of complete response, which is quite different from what we see with uh, systemic therapies in breast cancer or in bladder cancer where neoadjuvant regimens are associated with a 30% complete response rates when they improve survival in advanced disease. So I think that's a conundrum. Why is it that prostate cancer, despite having therapy, systemic therapies that are very active, why can't we achieve complete response rates similar to those other solid cancers? Uh, one of the rationale for the DUNS trial is understanding now uh, 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 using genomics of the heterogeneity of localized prostate cancer, that different subgroups may have variable responsiveness to different regimens, and hence using genomic segmentation of localized disease, identifying subgroups that may be more or less uh, susceptible to uh, um, androgen receptor or androgen deprivation type therapies, may be more susceptible to chemotherapy, may be more susceptible to a PARP inhibitor, uh, will allow us to then uh, potentially use a combination of regimens to push the complete response rate higher. GUNS stands for a Genomic Umbrella Neoadjuvant Study, where men with high-risk localized prostate cancer uh, enroll in the study. Um, we then sequence their needle biopsies. And uh, during the first eight weeks of therapy, they're treated with androgen deprivation therapy plus apalupumab as an AR antagonist. Um, it takes us about eight weeks to get that sequencing done. Based upon uh, their sequence, they're then assigned currently to four one of four different groups. And so if their um, the tumor has genes that would predict for increased androgen responsiveness, they would be assigned to uh, group one um, and then be randomized to more intensive therapy by adding abiraterone on top of apalupumab androgen deprivation in a randomized fashion. Group two uh, in, enrolls patients who have an aggressive tumor. They've lost P10, they've lost P53. So these tumors are associated with poor response to androgen deprivation therapy. And there they're assigned to that group and then randomized between AR pathway inhibitor therapy alone, plus or minus chemotherapy, in the hope that the addition of chemotherapy in that aggressive subgroup would increase uh, benefit uh, in that, uh, in that uh, genomic uh, subpopulation. The third subgroup would capture about 6 to 8% of patients who have uh, alterations in DNA repair, uh, BRCA as an example, um, where, uh, or um, um, FANCA and others uh, that have been associated with sensitivity to PARP inhibition. And they would then have their master protocol therapy, ADT plus apalupumab, with a PARP inhibitor, alaparib, or niraparib, I should say. And then the fourth group are those about 5% of patients who have an immunogenic type cancer because of alterations in MSI, Lynch, or CDK12, and they get um, um, uh, a pd one inhibitor with that therapy. So again, it's a multi-arm, uh, multi-stage, adaptive design that allows certain arms to um, um, identify what we call conditional lethality. So based upon their tumor group, uh, their genomic sequence and their therapy, if we can increase complete response rates above 20%, that would be of interest, and that arm gets expanded. 
If they don't, then the arm gets dropped in the first 20 patients. Uh, so that limits, um, um, a, um, it's an early sort of go, no-go signal. It allows certain arms to be dropped off early, other arms to grow, and it allows new arms to be added as new targeted therapies, new understanding of genomic markers emerge over uh, the coming years. Well, in the, in the advanced stage, the treatment-resistant, castor-resistant stage, it's, it's bundling groups into uh, uh, segmented populations that uh, um, allow a, a framework of precision oncology. Certain tumors may be um, um, more susceptible, for example, to a PARP inhibitor or uh, maybe uh, AR-driven or um, uh, an aggressive phenotype if they're tumor suppressor loss or you know, mechanisms of lineage plasticity being activated. So genomics using DNA and RNA uh, are segmenting the disease uh, based upon uh, principal drivers of that progression and resistant phenotype. Um, in the localized setting, uh, we recognize that almost all these cancers are initially AR sensitive. The question is what um, determinants allow for um, them to be more completely AR pathway inhibitor sensitive versus less controllable. And so uh, uh, certain DNA signatures are identifying groups that are, um, um, for example, SPOP or CDH1 that may be more uh, dependent upon the AR and uh, more AR uh, pathway inhibitor sensitive. Others, the tumor suppressor alterations that uh, uh, create a, uh, a more proliferative, more AR-resistant type phenotype. Um, uh, so again, that's, and then of course the DNA repair and the immunogenic phenotypes that have already gone over. Um, but that's DNA, and that uh, needs to be complemented by other uh, omic signatures. For example, mRNA signatures may allow a definition of um, a basal type or a luminal type, which may provide additional insights into um, um, uh, sensitivity of different targeted therapies. Uh, so again, this is a, a, um, a field that is, has evolved rapidly and will continue to evolve as we better uh, understand uh, biology um, based on um, various signatures as opposed to just on cell phenotype itself. There are, um, at the University of Washington, there's a uh, NeoParp study, which is just looking at a PARP inhibitor in the small segmented population that are germline DNA repair altered. Uh, that's a PARP inhibitor monotherapy trial, so it's not combined with androgen deprivation therapy. In that group of patients in the breast cancer world, uh, PARP inhibitors are associated with uh, uh, up to a 30% complete response rate. Um, but we're not seeing that, uh, whether or not we see that as monotherapy in prostate cancer uh, will be tested in, in that trial. Um, there are other um, trials being conducted uh, uh, using various uh, immunotherapy uh, neoadjuvant strategies um, uh, based upon um, sort of immune infiltrate uh, or to characterize the immune infiltrate changes with hormone therapy and with uh, uh, PDL1 inhibitors as an example. Um, but the challenge has been um, uh, the time and cost required to get a genomic signature, um, and um, ultimately, many of the alterations occur in small subgroups, uh, subpopulations of patients. So to try and capture 10% of the population in one trial is very inefficient and costly. So what the GUNS trial tries to do is to allow us to capture as many subtypes as possible, bundle them in one trial, uh, test them in an adaptive way, um, um, uh, drop those that are um, not um, um, promising and to expand on those that are.